Washington Department of Transportation Secretary Roger Millar tonight. He's been in the position since 2016, overseeing an agency that is a steward of complex multimodal transportation system and responsible for ensuring that people and goods move safely and efficiently. He believes that planning and implementing transportation systems is not an end to themselves, but rather a means towards economic vitality, environmental stewardship, social equity, public health, and aesthetic quality. But he can tell you more about that now. With that, off to you, Secretary Millar. Great, thank you. And thanks everybody for being here. My wife wanted me to point out that the background is not our house. So if you can guess the virtual background, uh, you'll date yourself, but anyway, it's pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and talk at you for a few minutes and then we'll have plenty of time to uh, hopefully talk with you. So this is a presentation that I first gave to uh, the House and Senate Transportation Committees uh, when they first started the, uh, the 21 session about return on investment, some ideas from uh, our side, our perspective on the transportation future and how to work towards making that vision a reality. So I'm gonna talk about the opportunity, about how Washington invests in WashDOT, some hidden costs that we don't talk about to Washington taxpayers, and then some ideas for investment that pay a great return. So, it's really important that we remind ourselves constantly and that we, we talk to um, folks like you about how hard the legislature works to balance competing needs. And in 21, they have a lot of opportunities, quote unquote, to do that, um, to invest, to save lives, to meet our legal obligation, to move anadromous fish, <clears throat> to ensure a state of good repair of our system, to address justice, to address climate change, prepare for that uh, inevitable Cascadia subduction zone earthquake and, and move our economy. And um, some people think this is a cop out on my behalf, but it's, it's, it's not really. The, the, it's, it's the reality of how our, our government is organized and how the uh, legislative branch operates in Washington state. Everything we do is directed by the legislature in statute. Um, we have uh, 26 programs budgeted by the legislature, and many of those programs are budgeted down to the dollars per project, and we're not able to move money between projects. We're not able to move money between programs. That is all an authority that the legislature reserves for itself. Um, so when you look at our highway improvement program, for example, there's X dollars for project one and Y dollars for project two. And if one's coming in cheaper or faster or, or more expensive and slower, we're not able to, to pivot that stuff around. We do have some programmatic authority from the legislature in our, um, our active transportation programs with safe routes to schools and our, our bicycle pedestrian program uh, with our regional and rural mobility grants where we run competitive processes to select the projects. But the, the problem there is the amount of money that's appropriated by the legislature. So that is their authority. That's why they're elected. And we acknowledge and celebrate that. Um, what we're here to do as an agency is provide information and data to them in support of their decision-making process and then stand ready to implement the decisions that they make. So um, hence this presentation. So the people who live in Washington invest about $3.6 billion a year in the Washington State DOT. About a billion of that is our operating budget, which is split roughly 50-50 between operating the ferry system and operating, maintaining, and preserving uh, the highway system. Um, and then there's a capital budget of about 2.6 billion, which builds stuff. Uh, what do Washingtonians get for that investment in terms of a return? Um, our economy runs on our transportation system and that's uh, over a half a trillion dollars a year in trade and about 1.4 million jobs that are directly attached to that movement of goods and services. It provides access to quality of life, to work, to school, to shopping, to nature and recreation. 
Um, and Washingtonians love accessing our system to get out to nature. Unfortunately, a lot of them are doing that on the passes at 3.30 on Friday afternoon and then coming home on Sunday afternoon. And I guarantee you the snow's just as good on Tuesday as it is on Saturday. And the, the other thing that, that Washingtonians get in terms of return on investment is access to opportunity. So we have the fourth highest gas tax in the country. Uh, folks who don't wanna see anything more invested in transportation like to point that out. Um, where does that money go? Well, uh, after initiative 695 around the turn of the 20th century, <clears throat> long before I got to Washdot, I was down in Portland at the time, but um, the gas tax was around 20 cents a gallon. And eight cents of that 20 cents went to Washdot for everything it does. And 12 cents of the 20 cents went to cities and counties. Since uh, the turn of the century, we've had three initiatives with the nickel program passed by the legislature, the Transportation Partnerships Act, and uh, most recently Connecting Washington, which is the other 29.4 cents. All of that money is specifically earmarked for projects identified by the legislature and for paying bond debt for projects that have already been built. And by the end of this decade, we'll be approaching half of our gas tax going to, to pay bond debt. So when I talk about WashDOT operating the transportation system, maintaining and preserving the transportation system, we do that with that eight cents. It's the same eight cents we had 25 years ago, doesn't buy what it bought 25 years ago. And because of all of the investment in new stuff, we have more stuff to operate and maintain than we did before. So kind of our budget 101. Now here is that hidden cost I was talking about. There's our budget at 3.6 billion. Uh, you can't turn around, there was one today, without some report about congestion and how much time and how much money congestion costs Washington State. It's about four and a half billion dollars a year uh, that comes out of the pockets of Washington families and Washington businesses stuck in traffic. A state of good repair, the cost to fix our cars and trucks because our system is not in a state of good repair, and, and bicycles too. I had to fix a flat here recently myself. It's about 3.7 billion. A, a number that people don't recognize is the cost of the unsafe condition of our transportation system. We talk about safety an awful lot in terms of fatalities and serious injury accidents and minor, minor injuries and the like. And they are individual tragedies that are just indescribable for the families, the coworkers, the friends of people who are involved in these things. Um, I misspoke earlier, they're not accidents, they're crashes. Puppies have accidents, people have crashes. And what we have never done, and, and you know, we talk about those tragedies, but one thing I know about Washington drivers is that they're all the best driver in the state, every one of us, and we're never gonna be in that crash until we are. But what we don't talk about is what do those crashes cost our economy? And when you look at what they actually cost the economy of Washington, again, money coming out of Washington families and Washington businesses, it's approaching $15 billion a year, more than three times the cost of congestion. But our budget, we spend a billion dollars a year chasing congestion problems. Our safety budget is $50 million. Now there's other stuff we're doing that's safety related, but a program that's specifically focused on enhancing safety, $50 billion. And then we're just starting to track the, uh, in the dollar cost of greenhouse gas emissions on the system. Um, it's a, that's a very low number in my estimation, but I, you know, the way I work in these things, we're working in a fishbowl, so um, it's got to be a number I can go back and verify. That's 2015 from the Department of Ecology. You add all that up, <clears throat> Washington families, Washington businesses spending $25 billion a year because of the broken, congested, unsafe, pollution emitting state of our transportation system. And people are worried about paying the fourth highest gas tax in the country. If you were to convert those annual costs to what we would have to pay in gas tax, 
it's about $8 a gallon. So yeah, you're paying 49.4 cents a gallon at the pump, but the economy is paying about eight cents a gallon. And our position is, what if we made investments that cost you more in terms of taxes and fees, but reduced these hidden costs and netted out being a positive for Washington State, for the economy, for our businesses, uh, and for our families. So if we could make investments that resulted in a return on investment, I was at a press conference with the governor on Friday, and I said, the governor doesn't say, Millar, go spend money. He, he wants us to invest resources in projects and programs that pay a return. What would we recommend? What have we recommended to legislative leadership? We need to invest in preservation. There's a lot of work that we need to do. We know we need to do it. We've told people we need to do it. People are starting to listen to us on that, but the numbers are, are just staggering. And we don't leave these facilities broken because we want to. We leave them in this condition. We don't do the work because we're not funded to do the work. This is what we own. When I first came to WashDOT, when I first became secretary back in 2016, everybody's like, hey, connecting Washington just passed $16 billion package. It's a great day to be a secretary of transportation. I said, well, what, what is the enterprise worth? If you had to replace WashDOT today, what would it cost Washington? It's approaching $200 billion. And that $200 billion investment, just like if you buy a house or a bike or whatever, it needs to be maintained. And the average annual need when you add it all up is just shy of $2 billion a year, $1.8 billion a year. And that's, that's highways and bridges for sure, but it's also our aviation resources, our public transportation resources, our inner city passenger rail and freight rail resources that, that WashDOT manages. Um, our intra-agency stuff, like our facilities, our buildings, our fleet, the real estate we own, and the Washington State Ferries. We should be spending $2 billion a year. We spend $890 million a year, meaning we, we defer more than we spend. We defer over $925 million a year in terms of preservation work and maintenance work. And if you own a piece, if you own property, if you own a house, if you own a business, you know that if you don't invest in your in your property, um, it falls apart. You know, we, we put a roof on the house knowing we got to replace it in 20 years. What we're doing here is we put a roof on our, our washed out house and we're replacing it in 40 years instead of 20 years. And the uh, living room is going to get wet at some point. So another place where we need to make investment, and again, crashes, I, I, I having experienced it and having loved ones involved in the crashes are terrible things, um, but they have an economic consequence. We're a target zero state. Our goal is to get to zero by 2030. We've had that goal for 25 years. The number has been going the wrong way um, since 2013. And, uh, and that is a problem um, in terms of the lives lost, in terms of the the lives damaged, and in terms of the economic consequences for all of us. So what investments could we make? And, and again, talking about spending money, talking about investing money, but investing money in safe systems, investing money in a funded safety and systems operation program that takes a safe systems approach, that recognizes that you shouldn't reduce safety to move cars faster that you need to design roads to encourage good behavior. And when where roads have not been designed that way, we need to go in and retrofit those roads. Um, and that importantly, land use decisions should include investment to safely accommodate expected demand. We had some people that were killed a couple of weeks ago on what was an old farm to market state highway. And subdivision after subdivision has been developed along that highway but the development was not required to install the infrastructure on the state system to support that development. It wasn't required to do that because the Growth Management Act specifically exempts impacts to state highway facilities, state transportation facilities from development. <clears throat> so cities don't have to plan for it. 
and they don't have to exact it out of development when development occurs. So if you're a city or a county or a, a developer and you have a hairy transportation problem, what you want to do, and again, they're doing what the law says they can do, is you want to move your problem as quickly and cheaply as you can to a state highway because it's not your problem anymore. It becomes all of our problems. So another thing we need to do is accommodate all of the users of the system with a focus on the vulnerable users because the safety data that we're looking at shows that uh, people who walk and people who roll are being killed and injured at an increasing rate. And, and that has to stop. So we need to set speeds that lower the potential for fatalities and injury. We need to provide safe facilities for walking and biking. It's, it's a matter of funding. And we need to do some enforcing uh, to encourage appropriate behavior. The, the safety, the three E's are education, enforcement, and engineering. We tend to be on the engineering side of things with licensing and others doing the education and state patrol and others doing the enforcement. One of the things that we're looking at is traffic goes down, but crash levels go up. Um, that is, uh, it, it's inexcusable. Uh, state patrol clocked a uh, fine individual going over 190 miles an hour on I-5 in Snohomish County. Um, prior to the pandemic, it was just impossible. You could not go that fast because there was never enough room. And, and people, crazy people are doing that. We have the technology to enforce our speed limits and to enforce bus only lanes and to enforce block the box and to enforce, you know, HOV lane technology. All that, all that technology is out there. Um, there are two things that concern the heck out of me when I talk about applying technology in this space. Um, one is the potential for a, a loss of privacy and an infringement on my civil rights and yours. And the other is the potential of any enforcement regime um, disproportionately impacting low-income populations and people of color. We recognize that those are legitimate concerns. And what we're doing is we're going to be reaching out to people in the civil rights and privacy space and people in the equity space to sit down and at the table with us, understanding that all of us at that table are concerned about privacy and civil rights and equity. And I hope all of us at the table are concerned about the carnage on our highway system. If we can come up with something that works, that's great. If we can't, uh, we can't, but let's give it a shot. There's too many lives at stake. Another safety issue is homelessness and, and people who are unhoused living in our right of way. I wanna start off by saying that there's no one at the Washington State Department of Transportation that believes that living in our right of way is a safe and healthy and attractive way to live. It's not. I don't think there's anybody in Washington, including the unhoused who are living in our right of way who think it's the place to be. But we've gotten to a point as a society where that's the best place that they can find. And we are in, a triage situation. It is for our agency, um, not what we're stood up to do. And we want to encourage, we do encourage a holistic multi-agency approach to addressing the problem rather than moving it, you know, playing homeless encampment whack-a-mole, if you will. Remembering that these people are our neighbors. 85% plus of them are from Washington state. When you see somebody sleeping by the side of the road, they're sleeping by the side of the road, more than likely in the same county they lived in before they became unhoused. This is not people moving to Washington to live under a bridge on I-5. This is, this is our neighbors, our friends, our family members. And again, it's not a safe place, but we need to work together to focus on solving the issue rather than just treating the system symptoms. And we will do our share of that work. We have been. So getting to the congestion space, um, we are a multimodal transportation agency. I have been telling anybody that will listen that coming out of the pandemic, no one is safe until everyone is safe. This notion that I'll be safe, I won't take transit anymore, I'll drive my car. 
sure, until you get to work, and then you're going to get on a sidewalk with people who didn't drive their cars, or you'll be in a, an elevator or a parking garage. We, we won't be safe until we're all safe. And so we need to be thinking about these other ways of getting to where you want to be um, besides driving a car. And we also have to recognize that the pandemic has showed how important service workers are to our prosperous economy. But these individuals are often the ones that live furthest from employment centers because they can't afford to live any closer. And because they live the furthest, they have the fewest transportation options. So you've got families who are maintaining fleets of cars that they cannot afford to maintain in order to get to work because they don't have any other way to do that. So we as an as an agency are, are recommending to decision makers that if you're looking up for a place to make an investment that will pay a return to the transportation system, affordable housing is a key investment. Affordable transportation options are key investments and they're not social services, they're economic necessities for Washington state. Now, a lot of us who are maybe not as essential or essential in different ways have been able to telework throughout the pandemic. About a year ago, um, almost exactly a year ago, um, I sent the team home. We have 6,800 employees, about 4,000 of us have been telecommuting for a year. And it's worked. It doesn't work if you operate a snowplow. It doesn't work if you operate one of our ferries. It, it doesn't work if you're responding to crashes or doing uh, vegetation management on the roads, uh, or if you're on the Amtrak track Cascades trains. But for a lot of us and for a lot of people in our society, telecommunity is the new normal. It's forced us to use a technology we've had for a long time, and it's worked. And it's worked for employers and it's worked for employees. I have an awful lot of employees who are very happy with their telework situation. We, we surveyed our employees back in April um, when they'd been on the telework job for a little while. 70% of them liked it as much or better as working in the office. And we, we surveyed them again in the fall. And I thought after six months, people would be tired of the number went up. People like the flexibility that comes with it. They like not spending a, a part of their day every day commuting. Um, there are concerns about um, access to broadband and ergonomics and uh, what do we, I can't wait for my kids to get back to school and those kinds of things. But what we're finding is uh, people want to do this and people all around Washington and all around the country and the world want to do this. And we need to learn how to be a transportation provider in this changing work environment. It helps us manage demand without adding roadway capacity. If, if my employees telecommute 40% of the time, it reduces my, my agency's commute impact by 40%, but they'll be driving or rolling, the, you know, riding their bikes or whatever, at maybe at different times of day. So how does that affect our roads? How does that affect the transit systems we support? Um, how do we make sure that everyone in this state has access to adequate broadband to make this work? Um, and how do we make sure that the system is accessible for all of us? So um, some neat stuff happening there. We've been working, we set up a, a transportation demand management executive board uh, a year ago. Um, kind of evolving from our commute trip reduction work. And, and that group, which is a public-private group, including public health officials and uh, community organizers, a whole bunch of different people, are exploring ways to support Washington businesses as they wrestle with this issue. But here again, a place where we can make investments that pay a significant return. The people staying home has pointed out to an increasing number of people the importance of complete neighborhoods. Now, I came to Washington State DOT from Smart Growth America, where I was the uh, vice president for technical assistance. So I was working in this complete neighborhoods, complete streets thing for a while. I ran the National Complete Streets Coalition. I ran the, uh, the Partnership for Sustainable Communities Building Blocks for Sustainability Grant Program. 
Um, and before that, I was a planning director in Missoula, Montana and, and elsewhere. And I started in Portland where I was the person who uh, kicked off and uh, kind of conceived the Portland streetcar and, and managed the master planning of the Pearl District. So per complete neighborhoods are in my DNA, but with the pandemic and the stay home, stay healthy, a lot of people in Washington state saw their neighborhood in the daylight hours for the first time in a while. Mixed use neighborhoods provide, provide food security, access to services and the like. And we need to be designing our communities in a way that you can get everything you need within a 20 minute walk or bike ride. Not saying you have to, but if you wanted to, you could. When we live in a society where over a third, approaching 40% of the trips we take are less than three miles in length, but we take most of those trips in a car because it's not safe to take them any other way, we can do better than that. And if people can meet their needs without a car, then governments don't need to build new or wider highways. So investments that pay a significant return for Washington families and Washington businesses are sidewalks and bikeways. We need to catch up on accessibility. We have a, a legal obligation to do so. And we need to complete the state's active transportation system, fill in the gaps um, in the cities and the counties and in the state system. And, and that requires investment. The, the policy wherewithal is there. It's just a matter of funding. Another thing we need to look at is freight mobility. If anybody came through the pandemic well, it was uh, the online shopping world. Um, the consumer shift was accelerated. At the height of the shutdown, much of the traffic in my neighborhood anyway was package delivery. I know everybody was being productive, but they were also doing a fair amount of online shopping. So with these fleets cruising our neighborhoods, sometimes dropping by your house one or two or three times to get a package to you, what's the public interest in that last mile of, of freight door to door? What should our public investment be? What do we do to work with the fleet managers to decarbonize those fleets, to consolidate the services they provide, to provide neighborhood or, or district drop-off locations so that they're not cruising through the neighborhood all the time? What do we do to encourage options like e-cargo bike delivery and, and walking um, to deliver goods. Um, those are things we ought to be talking about. And in terms of investment, it's going to pay a substantial return in a lot of different parts of our transportation space. Another thing we need to do is invest more in operating our system. Uh, we have a lot of concrete and steel out there, as I indicated, close to 200 billion worth. And the way we operate it we get more throughput out of it. And you know, this is primarily a highway response, but it is a fact that we have a lot of traffic on our highways. And we also have these pedestrian and, and other treatments that we need to do to make the system safer. They provide uh, concrete results, pardon the pun, but you know, an example that I like to point out, um, my, not my favorite urbanist image, but on the left here, we have I-5 north of Seattle. On the right, we have I-405 north of Kirkland. They're both 10 lanes wide, 10 lanes of concrete and asphalt and steel. They both carry about 105,000 cars a day, five lanes in each direction. Because of the way we manage the five lanes in each direction on I-405, we're moving 35% more volume during the peak hour on I-405 than we are on I-5. And what I'm really excited about is we've created a space and the capacity to establish a bus rapid transit system in the corridor that's gonna knock an hour off of the transit trip between Linwood and Bellevue. So there are lots of places in the transportation demand management space where we make investments today, where those investments are woefully oversubscribed and there are opportunities for us to make investments tomorrow uh, that pay significant returns to our families and our businesses. And we need to make um, expansions to the system. I, I am not against expanding our transportation system. I am an engineer after all, in addition to be a planner. But the what I preach is you make expansions to the system only 
after you've tested every other possible alternative and found them wanting. When you have a problem, the first solution shouldn't be add a lane to the highway. The first solution shouldn't be add an interchange because those solutions are the least efficient things we do. They're the most impactful things we do. They're the most expensive things we do. And they're the ones that take the longest time. But when we need to add capacity, let's add capacity after doing that analysis and let's add multimodal capacity. Um, if we're going to make big investments in the transportation system, what about a multimodal I-5 corridor? What about ultra high speed rail? What about uh, commercial aviation and active transportation? We have billions we could invest in expanding our active transportation network. But we need, again, decision makers to understand these are the investments the people they serve want, and these are the returns that they're going to get on those investments. These investments pay, in, in many cases, multiple returns. They're a twofer or a threefer or a fourfer. Um, they're addressing safety, state of good repair. They're addressing congestion. They're also addressing the resilience of the system in the face of climate change, in the face of uh, Cascadia, subduction zone, and the like. Our state of good repair helps with our seismic retrofit. The fish passage obligation addresses state of good repair and a resilience question. The high-speed rail, the electrification of everything we do. And again, that land use transportation integration makes us a more resilient society. We are working to decarbonize the transportation space. We're preparing for EVs. We're preparing for hydrogen fuel cells. We're converting our ferry fleet. We've got uh, two of our big jumbo Mark IIs are funded for uh, conversion to hybrid electric. And we've got one new boat funded. And if the budget comes out the way the governor recommended, maybe we've got another boat funded. Those, those boats will take 10 million gallons of diesel out of our system, along with hundreds of thousands of tons of CO2. And it is a state of good repair investment because we're not expanding the fleet. We are replacing parts of our fleet that are aging out and we're replacing them with cleaner, quieter, greener boats. We're doing the same thing with transit fleets all over the state of Washington. We have the second highest number of electric buses of any state in the country. We also have the second highest percentage of electric vehicles as a percentage of the overall fleet of any state in the country. The numbers are still much smaller than I'd like to see them, but we're, we're in the lead there. Um, we also need to make investments in using technology and innovations to move our system, move our people and our goods and our services. Um, governance and financing, again, linking land use decisions with transportation investment is hugely important. It's the single smartest thing we could do if we wanted a return on investment. We somehow link the land use decisions that local government makes with the transportation investment decisions that we make at the state level and at the local level and, and take that to a regional or an even mega regional scale. There's an example in Spokane don't know if anybody's here from Spokane, but uh, the city of Spokane wanted to annex some land south and west of town, and they needed an easement in our highway corridor, the US-195 corridor for water and sewer. We granted the easement with the understanding that they would be extending their arterial street network out to serve that property. They chose not to make those investments because they didn't have to and because they didn't have the $40 million and they didn't want to exact the 40 million out of the development because the development wouldn't be affordable for the home buyers. And, you know, well, then that investment, that development isn't affordable and it shouldn't be happening. But what they did instead is they approved the developments and the houses were built, but everybody that lives in that development drives down the hill and turns left across a five lane highway with traffic going 65 miles an hour. And people have been killed on that highway and, and that's on us. But the fix on the highway to solve the problem created by not investing $40 million in an arterial street network or even smarter, 
not developing the hillside and redeveloping land in the city, the fix on the highway is a half a billion dollars that we don't have. And it's not the development's responsibility. It's not the city of Spokane's responsibility. It's, it's the taxpayers of Washington's responsibility. So in this investment scheme, the, the other thing about investment is investment in transportation just create jobs in Washington state. You don't do these things just to create jobs, but you have to acknowledge that that's the case. But I point out to decision makers, and I would encourage you to do the same, that you get more jobs per dollar spent depending on the kind of investment you make. You can create jobs by doing new bridge and road construction. But state of good repair work creates 16% more jobs per dollar spent than new construction. Public transportation work creates 31% more jobs per dollar spent. Bicycle projects create 46% more jobs per dollar spent than car only projects. And pedestrian only projects are the same way. So if you look at that hierarchy, active transportation, public transportation, state of good repair, new road construction. If you're um, interested in labor and getting jobs for the, the, the men and women in the construction trades, you invest accordingly. We at uh, the Washington State DOT have a commitment to racial justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. We're looking at everything we do through a lens of, of justice. It is one of the three pillars of our strategic plan. We want an inclusive workforce, a diverse workforce. We want the people that work for WashDOT to look like the people who pay the bills. We are working hard to diversify our business spend so that any business in Washington state that's qualified to work for us can work for us regardless of who owns it. We wanna create opportunities in the construction trades. We require our contractors to have 15% of the hours worked on our projects be worked by apprentices. And right now, 44% of the apprentice hours worked on WashDOT contracts are worked by women and people of color. So we're bringing people of color into the construction workforce. We're bringing women into the construction workforce. Those are good jobs that pay benefits and, and retirement and the like. And they're also opportunities once you learn the trade, if you want to start your own business, to start your own business. And the other thing we're working on is actively engaging with historically underserved communities and, and making sure that we're culturally competent in what we do. Now, as the secretary, one of the things I do is I sit on a couple of boards, the Western Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials and the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And after the tragedies, the crimes of, of last summer with regard to um, uh, the killing of, of, of black people um, you know, in, in our society um, and the unrest that followed that, uh, we took the lead in going to Washto and then ultimately to Ashto and getting resolutions passed that were passed unanimously by the CEOs of the DOTs. And those resolutions acknowledge that our past actions have disproportionately negatively affected low-income communities, minority neighborhoods, and people of color. And the legacies of those actions persist in disparities today. We agreed to hold ourselves accountable to engage in the work of advancing racial justice. And we agreed to strengthen our commitment to the values of the Civil Rights Act. Now, when I was in the meeting when the Ashto board voted on this, not a lot of people were surprised to see Washington state vote yes. But I sat in that meeting and watched Mississippi vote yes, and Alabama vote yes, and South Carolina vote yes, and Florida vote yes, and Georgia vote yes. Um, my family's from the South. I, I was amazed at the universal um, approach that was taken. This is the right thing to do. And I'm, I'm proud that Washington is taking a leading role in that. So concluding my talking at you and uh, get ready for your questions. Um, we are in a point where we have a unique opportunity to rethink our old models. Um, we can work with our partners and state and policy decisions. We don't make policy. We provide the expertise and ideas for the policymakers. And they listen to us, but they listen to their other constituents too. And we are one voice in that conversation. 
We're re-examining how we use our infrastructure to accommodate all people and modes. We're ensuring that our decisions are equitable and inclusive. We're exploring more and more how we operate and how we pivot in this modern work environment. We're looking for new and flexible sources of revenue, and we're emphasizing the resilience of the system and the need to select flexible and adaptable investment strategies. So that is my show. Um, if you go to the WASHDOT website, if you're interested in what we talked about, what I talked about, if you go to the Washington State DOT website and you go to the bottom right corner, you'll see priorities. And there's a priority called State of Transportation 2021. You click on that, there's a link to the presentation to the House, the presentation to the Senate, a longer presentation with some COVID stuff in it, a copy of it in PowerPoint format, and then a whole list of resources on the web uh, talking about our various regions, talking about our various systems. And I encourage you to look at it and use that information to uh, put together your thinking on this stuff and, and you know, do what you want to do about letting uh, people in power know what you want to have happen. So thanks for the time. And I stand ready to try to answer questions, Patrick. Great. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. That was super interesting. Um, align with, uh, I think, what a lot of people listening care about. Um, you mentioned at a press conference the other day and then also in your presentation that you think we need to invest more in maintenance of existing infrastructure as well as you know, in your presentation safety. Um, there's multiple transportation bills working their way through the legislature right now. Do you think that any of them line up with your values? Do you have a one that you think are, is most fulfilling that call to action? And I mean, what would you like to see in a transportation bill? Well, I'm not going to grade the different transportation bills. <laughs> I figured that was a dicey one. I, 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 we have been actively engaged in talking with the sponsors of those bills. They have reached out to us and we have offered our expertise. I've been working with Senator Hobbs for quite a while because he's, he's been on this longer than, than anybody with his forward Washington proposal. Uh, spent the summer as you know one of a, a the number of people that Senator Saldana spoke to, we, we engaged in that conversation. And we spent a lot of time um, with Chair Fai and the members of, of his committee who did listening sessions all over the state on this stuff. So everything that I talked to you about tonight and everything on that website in terms of resources was reviewed by us with those individuals. And they are taking that into account as they put their plans together. Um, we're the stewards of the system. We are subject matter experts, but I told you that, you know, Chair Fai did 90 listening sessions. Six of them were with us. So he talked to other people too. And, you know, that that is the key to what's gonna be in those packages is, is what they hear from their constituents. That's the way it works. Thanks. Um, so you, it seems like one of the big obstacles in Washington state at making greater investments in multimodal um, projects is the state constitution, which prohibits the spending of gas tax money on non-highway funds. Um, in an article in Publicola this week, Anna Zivarts of Disability Rights Washington and Paulo Nunez Uno of Front and Center called for eliminating the gas tax um, because of one, because of as a funding source, because of that, and as well as its disproportional impact on um, poor folks. And we're relying on a, some sort of new funding system that can allow greater investments um, in non highway projects. And what do you, where do you think we should be getting our money for transportation from? Well, it's, it's interesting if you look at what our policy goals are in law and, and what we're directed to do in law. All of our policy goals are about reducing VMT and alternative, we, we, we have very multimodal policy goals, but all of our funding mechanisms rely on the use of fossil fuel burning cars and trucks. And that, that 
lack of synergy there. I mean, they're, they're diametrically opposed. You know, everything we do to get people uh, to get around by walking, by biking, by taking public transit, all of those strategies, which are the right thing to do, result in a revenue loss to the transportation accounts. You can see when Connecting Washington passed and they raised the gas tax, the funding coming in bumped and then it plateaued again and it'll slowly drop off and then it'll bump, you know, and, and it does that. Um, we're at a point now with electric vehicles where electric vehicles, the, the um, early adopters have adopted. And what people are increasingly finding is that it is an economically viable alternative to a hydrocarbon fueled vehicle for folks who need a vehicle. And as, and it's not just you and me getting a bolt or something like that, it's, it's UPS deciding to electrify their fleet. It's uh, you know, power companies, it's, it's public works agencies. When that happens, you're gonna see that fuel equation, uh, that, that slope steepen up a whole bunch. Um, and that's, that's okay because we're achieving the policy. You know, the, the issue of, of climate change is, is a more important issue. Uh, to me, the issue of safety is a more important issue. What we replace that funding with though um, is, is something we should be talking about now. You know, we're talking about road user charges and, 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 and that's fine. Um, some people are talking about congestion pricing. We're, we're doing tolling, we're doing express toll lanes and the like. There are other ways to fund the system. We're, we're talking about um, getting the funding out of carbon. All of those conversations are going on. I think as we have those conversations, can we identify means of funding our system where the funding lines up with the policies we want to achieve as, as opposed to being opposed to one another? Because you know, when they're opposed to one another, those who are interested in, in having more money may make decisions that are not in line with the, the policy as written in, in statute. Yeah, what do you, um, do you think that we could go to a more like mileage based system or something, something like that? Yeah, the, the technology is not the hard part. The hard part is the policy conversation. And a lot of the policy conversation is being driven by the legitimate desire for um, privacy and the protection of, of our civil rights. Uh, there's also some concern about just the difficulty. It's, it's easy and cheap to keep track of gas sales and gas tax is an easy tax to collect. And this, you know, a, a per mile charge is going to be harder. And, and, you know, but the, the very progressive state of Utah um, my colleague Carlos Braceras, who's the director of the, U the Utah DOT, has been just been directed by his legislature to implement a road user charge system in Utah, starting with the, the electric vehicles on the fleet and expanding it ultimately to everything in the system. Um, the last time I was in DC in person, I watched the chairs and ranking members of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, Republicans and Democrats alike, all get up in front of all of us DOT execs and say they want a road user charge and they want it sooner than later. And what was really interesting is the Republicans wanted it sooner than the Democrats wanted it. At, at, at the federal level, they're having that conversation. Now, again, what works in Washington state is the purview of the state legislature. Um, we have some expertise in that area. They have directed the Washington State Transportation Commission to study road user charges, and they're making some recommendations to the legislature. I guarantee you there will be a conversation about new sources of funding. Some of that's going to happen this session, and some of that's going to happen over the next 10 years. It has to happen. Uh, it would encourage you to get educated on it, and, uh, and once you're educated on it, let your, let your views be known. Great, thanks. Um, we've had a lot of questions um, along the lines. I think just like you were talking about the link between where we get our money and where we're got, where it's you know versus our values. Um, we've had a lot of questions around the the seeming conflict between all our stated climate goals and our massive, uh, seemingly massive freeway expansion projects, like expanding 18 
167-509, the North Spokane Freeway Project. Um, and I know some of that's legislatively driven, but it also seems in deep conflict with what we say our goals are. Um, can you talk a little bit about those projects? They're, all those projects are legislatively driven. And the goals that we have are set in statute. They're in RCW. They're, they're, they're washed out goals because the legislature has given those goals to the legislature. What we're hoping to do with the investments that we're making is um, make them as multimodal as we can and, and look for synergies. Um, I look at, for example, the 167 between Puyallup and the Port of Tacoma. If that road is built and then managed in a way that connects the Port of Tacoma up with warehousing and distribution in the Kent Valley, the Rainier Valley, and results in jobs being created in South King County and Pierce County, such that people who live there can travel shorter distances to those jobs, then what is the net effect? Have we, have we created a positive? Now, if that road is built and managed in a way that it becomes a subsidized driveway to sprawl development in South King County and, and Pierce County, then we got a problem. You know, because if everybody's living out at Tahali and driving to South Lake Union, you know, that, that's, that's not what that project is about. So we're making investment, but the kind of investment we make and how we manage the investment and, and be more active about it, we're investing a bunch of money in, um, in I-405. We're investing that money to create an express toll lane system that it, what's exciting to me is it creates the opportunity for bus rapid transit that works. And you know, I've, I've done bus rapid transit that works and I've also worked in communities where they sell, it's bus rapid transit. It's just like riding on rail, except it's rubber tires. Trust us, trust us, trust us. And then once they pick the bus, they strip everything away from the project that makes it just like riding on light rail, but on rubber tires. The, the 405 express toll lanes, I mean, an hour saved between Linwood and Bellevue. That's pretty cool. We're getting ready to uh, let a contract this summer on the 520 project at the interchange of, of 520 and I-5. But what that investment does, that enti the entirety of that project is connects the HOV lanes on 520 up with the express lanes. So then in the morning, we have a direct transit connection between the east side and South Lake Union. And in the afternoon, a direct connection going the other way. Um, we're investing in multi-use paths in those corridors. I was fortunate enough to go with a, a contingent over to Copenhagen a couple of years ago and spend a week learning about how the Danes have built a bicycle system that is, is just, it's astounding what it does for their community and their economy. We have the bones of that same kind of a system. They have a thing, I, I hate the name, but they call it cycle super highways that um, radiate out from the center of Copenhagen into the countryside. And you can commute 25, 30 kilometers one way on one of these you know, mostly grade separated, wonderful corridors. We have corridors like that in the central Puget Sound, but connecting them up and, and making them viable commute corridors is, is something we need to work on. I was really adamant about including a multi-use path in the, in the gateway project, because I had this vision of uh, longshoremen down in the Tide Flats riding their bicycles from Fialop to work. And, and you know why not? It's six miles and it's flat as a board. Um, you wouldn't even need an e-bike to make that work. But you, know, you provide those opportunities and those kinds of things happen. If we can link our investments in multimodal with sound transit's investments in station access, if, if they're truly station access investments and not parking garage investments, we could do a lot to create an interconnected regional multi-use system that could be a great part of the economy. Those are the kinds of things we're, we're looking to get out of those mega program investments. The other thing we're doing is we're trying to find um, a constituency that is as vocal about state of good repair 
and is as vocal about safety as the constituencies on those projects are. Because you know, the ledge doesn't fund those projects because I know, let's put a project, they're, they're, they're being persuaded by lots and lots and lots of people. Um, and uh, you know, not surprisingly, uh, elected officials listen to the people that reach out and communicate their, their, their interest to them. Um, we're part of that conversation, um, but we're just, you know, we're a part, you're a part too. Great, that's a, that's a great point. Um, so a, a lot of people have posed the, the utility of rail um, to move people both in our region and you know, in, in the larger you know, Seattle to Portland and West Coast corridor. Um, where do you see rail, both the existing Amtrak Cascade service and high-speed rail fitting in? You know, we were right at the point with the Amtrak Cascades right before the crash where we were going to have six round trips a day in the corridor and it was going to be three hours end to end. And because we were off of the scenic corridor there along, um, along Point Defiance, it was beautiful, but it's also the most congested part of the BN system and it was where we got hung up. We were going to have 90 plus percent service reliability in that corridor before the crash happened. The crash happened, the pandemic happened, uh, but we have a plan in place to restart that service this summer. And we hope to get back to the six round trips a day. And it'll be a place where, you know, like for me doing what I do, if I wanted to ride Amtrak Cascades from Lacey up to Seattle and back, I could only do that for a meeting that started after lunch. But with the enhanced service, I could, I, it gets to where about 10 in the morning is the cutoff for having a meeting and, and taking the train to do it. So it becomes increasingly viable for people to use. We need to keep making those investments and we need to plant that flag out there for ultra high speed ground transportation. You know, I, I'm an army brat. I went to high school in Stuttgart. And when I went to high school in Stuttgart, I could get on a train at dinner time and be at Paris for breakfast. I, you know, I, I traveled all over Europe on those trains when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. And I took my kids back and we rode from Amsterdam down to Paris and back on, on that high speed rail. It exists on this planet and it's, it, it makes economic sense. It makes environmental sense. It's pretty cool. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to speak at a conference in uh, Nanjing. And I coupled that with a trip to Shanghai and I talked to my counterparts in, in both communities. I rode the maglev. I rode the, the high-speed rail from Shanghai to Nanjing. It was an hour um, and just smooth. It was incredible. And uh, I rode it back and I took the regional instead of the express. It was two hours and it went to three more stops. We could have that kind of system if we wanted to. And we could have it for prices that are comparable to the investments that we continue making in expanding uh, the highway system. So we're actively pursuing that. Uh, the governor is uh, a bit leading in that space. He's got the governor of Oregon and the, the pr premier of British Columbia on board. We're working on our federal partners. We're going to keep advancing that. There's some people saying with the downturn and the pandemic, why would you look at that? This is precisely the time you look at that kind of stuff because we need to have that vision of what we wanna be in the future. And frankly, we also need to be thinking about, again, my, my whole thing about transportation, it's a means to an end. The Cascadia mega region, what is the end state we want? What is, you know, you, you don't, just grab a technology and slavishly adhere to it. What you do is you say, this is what we want to be. This is what we want our communities to be like. This is what we want our economy to be like, what we want our environment to be like. What are the constructs that, that get us closest to the ideal that we want? And we, and we go for it. And I really do think, you know, back to the, 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 syn the synergy of, of policy and investment, if you look at what people say they want, the investments that we should be making are more on the, the lines of state of good repair, enhancing safety, active transportation choices, um, and public transportation choices, and the ability to go city to city by high-speed rail. Great. Great. 
Um, I know we're a little bit after seven. I don't know if you have time for another question or so. You know, dinner's waiting, but no, I got time. Take it away. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> I don't want to keep you from Jennifer Dulek. So, um, but I didn't want to uh, get out here without at least touching on I-5. Um, you know, I-5, it runs through Seattle. And I think what got me is an interview a couple years ago where someone met bridge, you know, all the way through our city that um, is also aging and in need of, you know, either major repair or replacement. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have looked at it also and looked at how it has divided our city and especially, you know, um, bulldozed through neighborhoods like the International District. Uh, when it comes time to like, and, and I know you started a process of looking at the corridor. Um, when we, when it comes time to do, you know, a new round of major investment in that I-5 corridor, how do you foresee um, doing it in such a way that we're repairing communities and you know ending pollution in the corridor and restitching the city together? And what's your what's your vision for that? You know, my my vision for I five um, with the limited resources that we have available to to us today. Mm -hmm. What, what I worry about is when at eight o'clock on a Monday morning, an expansion joint breaks on the Ship Canal Bridge because we haven't done maintenance and we get a backup from the Ship Canal Bridge all the way to Marysville. That's the kind of stuff that I worry about. I, I, I worry about um, a propane tanker truck turns over in the I-5, I-90 interchange and shuts Seattle down for 17 hours. Um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, that I'm worrying about first. Um, we have a project that we're doing uh, with a little bit of federal money. We're doing this with the city and the University of Washington looking at a, a virtual coordination center where we're going to virtually blend the transportation management centers of the city and the state and King County Metro along with everybody's incident response networks so that we're able to better respond to incidents and flex the transportation system to shift transit routes and give people information about how to get around. We're making those kinds of investments. What we need to do for the corridor from Marysville all the way down to Tumwater is again, planning that flag out there in the future, just like that flag I was talking about with high-speed rail. What do we want it to be when we grow up? And uh, you know, we build lids on 520, we're building one right now at Montlake and we built them on the east side. We, we did that at Mercer Island. A lot of people, I, I want one of those, you know, the, the, and I, I get, well, let's, let's look at what the issues are and, and think big and then prioritize the investment. And if a lid is at the top of the list after you look at all of that, that's great. Um, if it's not, it's not. You know, I, I think about what we did in the International District and what we did in South Seattle back in the 60s when we built those highways. And as we invest in those highways, we have to think about, you know, what we've done to those communities and how we uh, address those wrongs. You know, out in Spokane, you probably didn't know, but Spokane had a, um, a great, great park. Um, an Olmstead Park, wonderful facility. It's under I-90 because when we were building I-90, it was the path of least resistance in the eyes of the community leaders at that time. And so we bulldozed an Olmstead Park, just like we bulldozed businesses uh, owned by people of color. Uh, it was the path of least resistance at the time. Um, we know we've made those mistakes as a society. We need to, to right those wrongs as we invest moving forward. But specifically what the investments are, I, 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 I can't tell you. Um, I know we need to look at state of good repair. We need to look at the safety of the system and we need to look at what are the investments we make in the system in the context of the communities we want when the investments are made. Great. Well. Um... I don't want to keep you from your dinner any longer, and you've been very generous with your time. Uh, I really appreciate your presentation. I'll show you taking the time to answer questions. No, I'm happy to do it, and I would encourage you uh, invite us back. You know, um, one of the things I did when I 
got on the job was I created an active transportation division at WashDOT and I was lucky enough to be able to hire Barb Chamberlain. Um, invite Barb to come tell you about what we're doing. Um, I know a lot of people have been reading our active transportation plan and using that resource to, to make their points. And that's what we, we want people to do with the work that we do. If we have that expertise, it's all public record, it belongs to you. So get it. And you know, I gave you a whole bunch of resources on the website, take those resources and run with them um, and let your voices be heard. So thanks for spending some time with me and uh, be sure to follow up. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for taking time out of your um, evening to talk transportation policy. It's great. Hopefully this, this new transportation bill will be more about safety, more about multimodal, more about climate change and less about new concrete and freeways. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us.